Okay, we're gonna go ahead and, and get started. So if you're still getting coffee or snacks, whatever, just meander back in, it'll be fine. Um, so um, I wanna talk a little bit about, let's see, let me see where I'm going. Yeah, okay. All right, so how do you actually compute all of these different measures that I've told you about, right? You might be interested in like, oh, I have this, these data, like, okay, now what do I actually do to get some measures that I could use in a regression model? Um, and so that's what we're gonna talk about next. Um, so egocentric network analysis poses some problems. Um, it's more difficult than having regular data uh, because you have data at two different levels, right? Um, and this is not suitable for sort of traditional uh, regression analysis techniques for reasons that we'll talk about in a minute when we get to multi-level modeling. Um, but most tools that are designed specifically for social network analysis aren't really a good fit either um, because you either have to join lots of ego networks together into one big, uh, what Steve Borgatti calls galaxy of ego networks, um, or you have to repeat the analysis for every ego network in your sample, right? Um, and so, for example, if you're using something like the GSS, then you have over a thousand ego networks. And so you can create these uh, scripts that will allow you to go through and, and uh, do each one quickly, but who needs all that <laughs> mess? Um, so there are generally two strategies uh, that you use for dealing with these complications of having um, essentially multi-level data. So one is to aggregate everything up to the ego level and then analyze using conventional regression models. So we're going to talk really briefly about that um, because I assume you all have used regression and, and know how to use it. Uh, analytically, it's very straightforward. Um, but it's limited compared to the like super awesome things you can do with multi-level modeling. Um, and then the second option is to use multi-level models with alters, nested, and egos. Um, and this is a little bit more analytically complex, although as you'll see, it's really not that complex. It has all these fancy names and we try to make it seem super complicated, but it's actually pretty straightforward, um, particularly in uh, its interpretation. Um, the only catch is that it's only for dependent variables that vary within egos, right, or vary across alters. So you have to have variation at your level one alter level, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So um, what I'm first gonna talk about is aggregation to the ego level, which is by far the most common way that these data are analyzed, um, and then to the standard regression tools. Uh, so some measures are too complicated to be reasonably calculated by hand. Uh, a lot of them are very easy. Um, and so if you um, use R, you can use like the AVE command. Uh, if you use Stata, you can use the EGEN command, which is like my favorite thing in the whole entire world, um, to pretty easily calculate a lot of these measures, like you know the mean of the network or the maximum, minimum, standard deviation, et cetera, using these different mathematical functions. Um, but others are much more complicated. Um, and also, you know, either way, you have to write a lot of code right, to create these variables by hand. So we can use ENET when it's working to facilitate creating these variables. Um, so I want to show you really quickly, uh, and then Steve is going to fix this, or I will kill him. Um, because I wrote a book about it, God damn it. Um, so he's gonna fix it. Um, so it accepts data in conventional wide formats. So the first one that I talked about, right, where you've got, you know, A, age one, A, age two, A, age three, right, and all the data about alters is contained within rows. It accepts that kind of data uh, in just Excel. So it's really versatile because you can export to Excel in any uh, stats package that you might use. Um, and then it also has a function to export data in lots of different formats to any stats package you might use. So that's really nice in that way. Um, and then you can calculate these aggregated measures super easily. So I'm going to just run through really quickly on the slides how to do this, and then I'll open up ENET for you and show you how it works. Then when ENET is working and you have to do this later, you'll have a refresher of how I did it on the slides, right? So hopefully, I mean, it's super simple to use when it works. Um, so basically you have an Excel spreadsheet, you import it into ENET um, using file import. Uh, the program looks like this. Um, and once you open the data file, it'll ask you which kind you wanna open. Uh, almost everyone is gonna use column wise. 
The others are like VNA and UCI net system files, which no one that doesn't use UCI net would ever, ever use. Uh, so this column wise is the default, and that's what you're gonna, gonna use most of the time. Um, and then you get a pop-up that looks like this, and uh, it tells you how many cases you have and how many variables you have. So that's just a good way of checking, oh, does this look like what my data looks like, or does this look really different than what I expected? Um, so it's just sort of a good check to make sure that you're kind of generally on the right track. Um, and then all the variables will pop up here on the left, um, and you can select and move them to yourself, uh, move them yourself. Uh, and so in this box, you put uh, variables that are characteristics of ego, right? Here, um, alter level variables, so characteristics of ties between egos and alters or characteristics of alters. And then here's where you put your alter, alter ties. If you name them properly so that there's a number uh, after each one and the same root, um, then you can use this auto and it just moves everything over for you, which is really nice if you have um, lots of variables. Um, so that's what it looks like afterwards. So we typically only have one measure of alter alter ties, and in this case, I think this is, I think these are GSS data. It's friendship, um, and then it imports the data. So this is the ego view, and then you can toggle here between different kinds of data. So it'll store all the alter data in a separate file, and then alter alter ties in a two by two matrix, like you're used to be used to seeing in whole network analysis. Um, and then you can calculate these metrics super, super easily, which is super nice. Um, and those will appear in this measures tab. And I'll tell you in a minute what, what these measures mean. Um, so all the variables that it outputs follow this format of uh, your original variable name, colon, whatever the measure was. Um, sometimes the variable name is abbreviated because it doesn't fit, and that's really the only tricky thing. So if you all read Scott Long's book, you should be using short variable names anyway. So sometimes like grad students will give me a file and there's like a 50 like digit <laughs> variable name. I'm like, what is this? Like I immediately start like convulsing a little. Um, so for composition, you're gonna have um, the variable name and then uh, number and then it'll be just the percent in that category. Uh, then average is mean, mat, and then the rest are uh, self-explanatory, and then total is just the sum, which I've never actually used, but whatever. Um, for heterogeneity measures, uh, it'll output blouse index, the IQV, and standard deviation. Uh, and then for homophily, it'll do proportion same as ego, EI index, and average Euclidean distance. And then the structural variables, their names are really obvious, so I'll show you what those look like. And then once you have your measures, you transfer them to the egos tab, output it as an Excel file, and then you just import it back into whatever stats program you want. So in literally like two minutes, you can calculate all the measures we talked about today. Super, super easy when it works. Um, and this is just the R code for if you ever want to read an Excel file into R, this is how you do it. Okay, so let me show you what, what it looks like. There's some other cool stuff that you can do um, in ENET as well, like visualize, which can be kind of cool. Okay, so this is what it looks like. I don't know how to, if I can make this text any bigger. But basically, you just go to File, Import, um, and then find the file. Uh, this one should work. And so this tells me that, well, it went really fast. It did tell me how many cases and variables I had. Um, this is already named so that I can just bring them over. So you can see I have age one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Um, and then my ego variables have no numbers after them. So everything's properly named. So I can just go down here and click auto and it automatically moves everything over, which is pretty sweet. And then I click okay and cross my fingers. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> we just give it a minute. Just give it a minute. Come on, Steve. Okay, I think it's working. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that was really fun. Oh, my God. Sorry. Um, okay, so these are the ego variables. I'm in the egos tab right now, right? So this is the 
case ID number, uh, gender, age, race, education, and religion of the ego. I can click on the altars tab here. Um, and this is all the information about altars. And each uh, row here is an altar, right? Um, and then I have the altar, altar ties tab, um, which essentially is a file where it tells me uh, the relationship of each altar to each every other altar, right? So it basically just takes the one file that I gave it and splits it up into three different files. The cool thing is, so if I go to measures, there's nothing here right now. Um, apparently you can do some basic types of analyses using Steve's QAP procedures, which I assume you're going to learn about. Yeah, okay, elsewhere. So you can do some, some simple stuff um, about cross tabs and things. I don't ever use it for that because I do all my analysis work um, in Stata, but you can do that if you want to. Um, but the coolest thing is, so let's say I want to create composition measures. So the only thing I need to know or pay attention to is whether, um, my, uh, whether my variables are categorical or continuous, right? Because I need to put them in the right space so that it creates the right kind of variable. Um, so like I could put sex here and then let's see, what's one that I know? Um, education is continuous, okay? So then I click OK, and it creates these variables for me uh, for each ego. So these are now ego level. So I have the average education um, in ego one's network, max education, minimum education, uh, the sum. You'll never use that. Uh, and then for categorical variables, uh, this network is 60% women because one is female uh, and 40% male. And then I can create other cool stuff. You can just keep adding measures as much as I want. I can do heterogeneity. So for categorical heterogeneity, I could do race, for example. And then it'll create a blouse index, a IQV. Oh, God, this is a sad statement about uh, networks in America. <laughs> They're very heterogeneous. Um, and then I can go back and do continuous measures, which is going to be uh, average Euclidean distance. So like I could do age. Do you all generally understand what I'm doing? I mean, it's just doing shit for me, basically. I'm just like pulling things down. So, um, so I have a standard deviation here for age. Um, and then I can go back and do homophily measures in the same way. So in this case, I have to have matching variables, right? So I have to know the same thing about ego and alter, and it has to be in the exact same, the cat response categories have to be exactly the same, right? So you just have to be kind of careful about how you set your data up. But once you do that, um, it'll even tell you which variables are matching, and then you can decide whether they're categorical or continuous. So for example, I can put sex over here in categorical and click OK. I don't know why it wants to give me that. This is kind of a quirky program. Um, and then I have uh, the proportion same as ego and the EI index, right? And then lastly, I can do the structural holes measures. Um, and there are a couple of different options here. So if I have the exact same variable for um, ego alter ties as I do for alter alter ties, right? So say I ask the exact same question about each altar that I did about altar altar ties, then I could create uh, different weighted ties from ego to altar too, and then my measures become even a little bit more informative. Um, usually you don't have that, um, so the, the default is just that all the ties are the same weight. Um, and then you can weight your altar altar ties as well. Sometimes they're weighted, sometimes they're not. Um, in this case, they are weighted by this closeness variable. And then I wait a minute, and it does some fancy stuff, hopefully. Uh -huh. And so then it creates all these SH variables. So degree, density, effective size, efficiency, constraint, and hierarchy automatically for you without having to go through the rigmarole. So pretty awesome. Then you can click this little arrow button, and this is on your slides, and it'll send all the measures over to the Ego tab. Slowly. There we go. 
So now they're all over here with my ego level variables. So I don't even have to merge them later. It's all merged right here. Um, and then I can export it as an Excel file and then save that Excel file and then just open it back up in whatever stats program I want, right? And everything's already created for you. Um, the one other kind of cool thing that this does is that you can visualize the ego networks and there are a few options. So there's a wheel with ego at the center. Um, there's a wheel with variable link spokes and then spring embedding, which is I assume what you'll teach them about. Okay, so this is the, the most informative one. Um, so you can either have it sort of automatically scan through the networks um, or you can manually scan through them, which, you know, really the, the best use in ego networks of visualization, in my opinion, is for showing ideal types, right? Like, oh, um, you know, networks that are super densely connected are associated with X health outcome. And then you say, this is the network of, you know, ego number 73, and this is an example of a really dense network, right? And this ego's health value is X, right? So they're really useful for that. And plus reviewers just really like pictures. <laughs> so, you know, if you're doing ego networks and you feel a little bit left out uh, of the whole visualization phenomenon, then, then you can use them here. Okay, so any questions about ENET? Super simple to use, really useful, will work soon. <laughs> questions? Huh? Free, it's free. It's free. That's the best part. It's free. That's why it doesn't work. <laughs> if we paid for it, it would totally work super well. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Steve does all this just like for fun because he's awesome. Um, so, okay, no questions about UNET? Okay. All right. So why don't you guys go ahead and open up R because we're going to talk a little bit now about um, regression. Um, and I'm trying to think about what's the best way. So let me just run through a few slides. You can go ahead and open R if you want and run. You can run the whole file if you want to and then just sort of scroll up to the top. Um, it should, if you've already installed the libraries. So, so when did you send out that file? Like when I got here about around lunchtime? So there's like a libraries file. I forget what it's called, like install libraries, installation file, something like that. Um, that Jim sent out, and so that one um, you'll have to run first before you run the other one, because all those libraries need to be like in your R before you can call them up. So run that first while I'm jibber jabbering about regression, and then if you want to run the other file, where's that other file located? Okay. Awesome. Okay, so there should only be two R scripts, right? Awesome. Okay, so while you're opening R and doing that stuff, I'll be talking about um, regression, which is hopefully really familiar. Okay, I'm going to do this. So we can sort of think uh, broadly. This is um, a, a Lisa Berkman graph that she did in one of her many super awesome publications about networks and health. Um, but we can kind of think about um, measuring social networks here, right, ego networks. And then we can think of sort of upstream factors, which are things that shape or condition social networks. And then we can think about downstream factors, um, which are sort of the consequences of social networks, right? So we can use ego network variables as either an independent or a dependent variable in regression models, depending what kind of model uh, we have and, and what we're interested in testing. Um, Steve, too, has a really nice thing where he talks about theories of networks and network theories, and it's pretty cool. Um, and I think he, it's in a, some paper of his. So if you're interested, um, email me and I'll send it to you. It's also in our book. Um, so this is generally kind of how we can think about things, right? So what are the consequences for, you know, psychosocial mechanisms like support and influence and social capital? Um, and then what are the even downstream effects of that, like, you know, well-being or psychological distress or IV drug use or, or whatever sort of health thing you, you personally are interested in? So I'm gonna, we're going to run some models really quickly here in R, um, and they're just standard regression models where the measures are all aggregated up to the ego level, so it's just a single level model. 
Um, just one thing you want to be careful of that I don't have time to go to talk about in detail, but um, there are uh, some very common model violations in ego network research. So multicollinearity is one. So for example, all those measures of structural holes that I told you about are probably going to be collinear, right? So they're, they're uh, really highly correlated. And so if you try to put them together into a model, then it often causes problems. So you have to be really careful about checking for all these regression assumptions that you probably stopped um, checking for when you got out of uh, stats one. Um, Nonlinear relationships, right? So we see a lot of skewed variables. Um, and so there's often a diminishing return, for example, right? So when you're going from you know, two supporters to three supporters, that makes a bigger difference than when you're going from 10 supporters to 11 supporters, right? So that would indicate a nonlinear effect. So you just have to test for these kinds of things and be careful. Skewness, same thing. Closeness is always skewed. Um, density is usually skewed. And then you often have heteroscedasticity too. I'm just assuming you all know for the sake of time what these things are, so. Um, but uh, with heteroscedasticity, you usually get more error, bigger errors when you have larger networks, right? So that causes these sort of fan-shaped residuals. Um, and so you have to really be careful to check for these things too, right? Because big networks look really different in terms of variance uh, than small networks. Okay, so just things to be careful of um, that we don't really have a ton of time to go into today, but just be sure you're fastidious about checking your models. Um, okay, so let's do a little bit of parallel play. Okay. Okay, so is everybody able to get their R opened and their second script open and run? Did it run? Yes, did you run it? Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna run my libraries. So you're gonna do things like set working directories, blah, blah, blah. This is all the boring like housekeeping shit that you have to do. Um, I am not an R user, I'm a Stata user. I have like very, very, very rudimentary R knowledge. Um, but Jim made me do it, so. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's say, for example, so you can go down to where it's annotated linear regression, number one. Uh, we might want to know what are the effects of occupational prestige on the density of people's ego networks on average. So what would you, you all hypothesize that the relationship with, would be? So you think that the more prestigious their occupation, the more dense their personal networks would be? Okay, so what, like why? What, what do you think? IRS, yes. So, they, so more of the people in their network would be connected to more other people in their network? Maybe not. Maybe. Yeah, I was thinking the opposite. Why? I, well, uh, I would imagine that people in lower prestige occupations would, those are also like a greater percentage of the population. So I imagine because there's, like imagine a bunch of construction firms, those people Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, let's see, right? So I think you could um, conceive of a theory either way, right? Um, but typically, we think of uh, people that are higher SES as having more diverse <coughs> networks, right? Or greater network range, which would suggest that, the, that those networks would have lower density, right? So who knows? It's an empirical question. Um, so I think what I was doing here is just describing uh, our major network variables of interest. So this is the SH density uh, variable from uh, ENET. I created these in ENET. Um, and then we also have a network size variable. If we wanted to include that, we could. Um, so you can run that to look at what the, the data look like, which I would suggest you do if we were not in a hurry. Um, but for now, we can go ahead and run the model. Um, and so if we look here at prestige, can everybody see this? Yeah. So how would we interpret this estimate of negative 0 0.003? Right. Yep, exactly. 
So it's kind of what we would present, um, predict from like a structural holes type argument, right? That people who are in uh, positions of power and prestige have networks that have fewer connections to each other and more structural holes. So that's one way that we could use it. Um, here, uh, if you want to run these histograms, I'm just showing you essentially that these data are skewed. Network size looks OK, um, but density, not so much. If you go back to the last figure, um, you can see that uh, density is negatively skewed, which is really common. In These are GSS networks, so uh, these tend to be core networks. So people are usually, alters are usually connected to one another because these are important matters networks. So I think, didn't Jimmy talk about important matters networks? Yeah. So these tend to be pretty densely connected because you usually only talk about important matters with like kin and really close friends. So a lot of them know one another. So we see this skewed variable. Um, so we could, for example, then change the functional form to squared going down the ladder of powers. Do you remember this? Oh, am I like tapping into some deep, dark, horrible recesses of your brain? Like you're getting graduate school, like PTSD. Um, and so we could just change the functional form then of that variable here. Um, and so, you know, in R, you always have to say like, oh, I'm going to create this new variable in this data set, which is one thing that I hate about it. Um, uh, and so I can do that just with this mathematical function of the tilde 2. Um, and I can run the histogram on this new variable. And it looks better. It still looks kind of shitty, but better than it did before. And then I can run my model again. Um, and it's going to be like basically uninterpretable without a graph. Uh, but that's what I should do, right, is change the functional form. So all this is just to say this is how I could use this measure as a, a network measure as a dependent variable. Here's a common problem that we would run into with this variable, and here's how to fix it, right? OK, uh, we'll do one more. Um, and this might be more along the lines of health stuff. So what's the effect of structural holes on happiness? Um, so, you know, if you have these, uh, these sort of absent ties in your network, does this make you more happy or less happy? So I could probably come up with a theory either way, right? So um, it could be that I have more access to novel and exciting stuff, and therefore I'm more happy if I have lots of structural holes. Or I could go with more of a Coleman's closure uh, Closure argument and say, well, you know, if I have less structural holes, then I feel protected and I'm in this, you know, warm and fuzzy network of people that all know each other and all like me and, um, and that feels good too, so therefore I'm happier. Um, so let's check it out. So in R, you have to make sure that your dependent variable is listed as a binary variable. Uh, it has to know that it's binary, so you have to run this dumb thing here. Um, and then I'm going to run uh, here, I'm going to store in model 4. This is just a, a general linear model. Do you guys know how to, what these regressions mean? You guys already went through that. Well, but I mean like the R code. Do you guys, oh shit. Huh? Oh, okay. Well, shit, I should probably do that. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to run a type of model. Uh, our dependent variable is going to be first here, right? And then it's gonna, we're going to store the estimates in this model for uh, place over here. And then I have um, my independent variables over here. I'm going to tell you what kind of model it is. In this case, it's a binomial model. Um, and then the summary essentially says, okay, you've run this model and you've stored it in model four. Now output it, right? So let me see what we've got. And um, so that's like my R translation, basically. What happened to model three? What? What happened to model three? Um, I just skipped a model two. I just skipped one. Oh, no, it's, oh, I'm skipped model three. Okay. It doesn't mean anything. I just took it out. I could call that anything. I could call that like right, right. teddy bear. Yeah, no, you're not missing anything. I just misnumbered them. Okay, so let's go ahead and run it. So I can go here and look at the coefficients. So let's see what kind of exciting stuff we have. 
So it looks like uh, the more dense our network, the more likely we are to be happy. Uh, these are crappy, uninterpretable log odds. So let's run our odds ratios. And so it looks like um, a one unit increase in density is associated with a 57% increase in the odds of being happy, right? So in this case, Coleman wins, right? And closure is better, and so that's great. Uh, and I think when you're interested in health outcomes, that's most typically what you're gonna find, uh, unless you're looking at something like um, treatment seeking, right? Where having access to, to novel stuff is gonna be good for you. Um, if you're married, that you're more happy. I don't know if I agree with this, <laughs> but some people might say that that's true. Um, <laughs> Real quickly, just for fun, so anybody who knows me well knows that I fucking love interactions. I think they're like the most fun thing in the world and like I basically never do an analysis that doesn't have interactions in it. Um, and they're really, really fun with network variables, right? Because you can essentially say, how does the effect of this change as a function of the network context, right? Which is just like the most fundamentally interesting question that you could ask if you're like, geeky about social networks. So for example, here um, I might say, well, does being married change the effect of density on happiness, right? So maybe if I'm married, then I don't need really dense network because I'm getting all that close fuzziness from my partner, right? Um, so the way that I would run this in R is that instead of using the, the plus here between my independent variables, I use an asterisk, which you know, indicates an interaction and it will automatically include uh, both of the original terms and then the interaction term for those. Um, so I'll run model five and then my uh, odds ratios. And so here, um, do you all know how to interpret odds or uh, interaction terms from odds ratios? Do you, should I go through it? Okay, I'll go through it. Okay, so here, this is the effect of, let me move my cursor. So the original variable here is the effect of density when married equals zero. So in other words, this is the effect of density for non-married people. So that's the group specific effect, right? And so here we can see that a one unit increase in density almost uh, triples the odds of being happy if you're not married, right? So to get the coefficient for people who are married, we take this coefficient times the interaction term, and that gives us the effect for people who get a one on married. And so you'll have to, did I actually run the? Yeah, look, I already did it, I'm so smart. So I just take one odds ratio times the other. If this was a linear model, I would just add them, right? It's, it's additive, here I have to, um, multiply them. So if I run this uh, little calculator, I can totally do calculator in R. Um, then I find out that the coefficient for married people is only 1.06, which it, as it turns out is non-significant. So basically, whether you have a dense network or not, doesn't matter if you're married, because you're like getting all that closure stuff at home, right? But if you're not married, if you're a single person, then having a network that's really densely connected, being really socially integrated is really positive for your sense of happiness, right? Isn't that so much cooler than asking like whether being in a dense network makes you happy, <laughs> right? Like it's so much cooler to use interaction terms. I really advocate this. Okay, all right, any questions about using regular regression? Yeah. Can you say that last part of your question again? <laughs> oh my God, this is, I'm having a Charlie Brown moment. I'm like <laughs> seriously half deaf. Okay, say it one more time. Sorry to be up in your business. Oh, how do I know if it's significant or not? Oh, okay. So, um, well, this is, you're actually opening up a big fat can of worms um, because this is a, a nonlinear model. Um, in a linear model, if the interaction term is significant, then, uh, then the interaction is significant. 
So like if I go back up to my original model here, this is my interaction term, ah, and it's significant, right? Technically, because this is a nonlinear model, then I have to do something like Scott Long's um, delta method, where I look at the predicted probabilities and whether the uh, confidence intervals for the predicted probabilities overlap. That's like way beyond what I can do in R. <laughs> this is gonna be perfectly <laughs> fucking honest. I can do it in Stata uh, real easily, but not in R. Um, so that being said, 99% of the time in the literature, I would not advocate doing it wrong, but usually people still use the significance of the interaction term, even in nonlinear models, but you should not do that. You should go read Scott Long's paper on the delta method. Does that make sense? But just pretend this is a linear model. Um, in which case I would say, oh, look, I see a star, so yay, this interaction is significant, right? And then I would have to do the, the tricky multiplying of the, co of the odds ratios to get the group-specific odds ratios, or the group-specific effects. Make sense? Okay. Um, okay, so I, I can do it this way. So this is the effect for, um, for non-married people. And so I can use this p-value right here, right? So an easy way to do it is to just reverse your marital variable and then the zero becomes married and then it'll spit everything out for you. You can also calculate it um, and there's probably a way to do it in R. I know there is in Stata R people, do you know? The hmm? The, method. the what? The delta method? No, not the delta method, the, to, to calculate the standard error of the estimate for the for group effects for each of the groups i don't know this is our limitation but a way that definitely works recode flip the marital status variable rerun the model and then this coefficient um <coughs> is going to end up being not this coefficient this odds ratio is going to end up being this times 0.36 or 1.06, and then you can just tell, look at the stars. Um, it's non-significant in this case, right? Which makes sense because it's super close to one. Does that make sense? Okay. Teaching you all the tricks for like backdooring <laughs> stats methods. <laughs> Ooh, is this being recorded? Oh, God. Um, okay. Um, other questions? No? Okay, perfect. Let's move on to something even more complicated. <laughs> uh, okay, hold on. Multi-level models, y'all. All right, so most of you already know how to do these, which makes me super happy. Um, but maybe it'll be a good refresher for those of you who that think you know how to do them, but um, you know, actually didn't fully understand it. I had to take two multi-level modeling classes before I really not like full classes, but like workshops to really understand. So I think this is something where repetition is really super helpful. Um, so hopefully it will be useful um, for, for a lot of you. Oh my God, okay. So there are two parts of any regression model, right? Uh, including multi-level models, including regular OLS regression. You have the fixed effects part of the model or your fixed parameters. So these are your betas or your odds ratios. These are the things that you're used to caring about. These are the things that you test hypotheses about. And it's essentially how the expected outcome uh, for a given observation varies as a function of values of predictor variables, right? So these are your estimates uh, that we care about. And then there's this whole other part of the model that we usually don't care about at all. Um, and we make all these assumptions about it, but um, most people actually probably don't test those assumptions even though you always, always should. Um, and these are your stochastic or your random parameters uh, or your residuals, right? So um, these are the things, th this is the E at the end of your regression model, right? And another way to think of it is uh, if you draw a regression line through a bunch of scatter plots, it's the distance between your observed observation, your actual observation, and your predicted observation, right? So it's the errors. So we assume they're normally distributed, blah, 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 right? But we normally don't care very much about them. So I'm here to tell you that multi-level modeling is actually really simple because the only thing about it that's different is how the residuals are distributed and related uh, across observations. That's the only way that multi-level models differ. So in terms of the things that most of you care about, like um, the estimates and how you interpret those, those are not any different. 
than a regular regression model. So even though there's all these like millions of fancy names and they're all fundamentally the same goddamn thing, it's really super simple. Okay, um, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, when and why should you use MLM for ego network research? Um, so there are some formal requirements. So first of all, your dependent variable needs to be at the alter or the tie level, right? So if we think about a multi-level model as having perhaps uh, two levels, where the ground floor is level one, uh, level two is your higher order uh, group. So we would have alters at level one and egos at level two um, if we're doing ego network research. So your dependent variable has to be at the alter level. It has to be something that varies across alters, right? So that's number one. Um, if you're interested in predicting something like ego health, then you have to use a regular model, right? You can't use multi-level model. Um, because there's nothing, nothing is varying at level one to predict, right? Ego's health is the same across all alters. Um, the cool thing though is that even though your DV has to be an alter or a tie level variable, your independent variables can be at any level. So you can predict what's happening at the tie level using characteristics of alters, using characteristics of egos, characteristics of the networks, whatever you want. Um, so it's really versatile in terms of your independent variables. Um, another requirement is that the personal networks of egos do not overlap or the overlap is negligible. Um, so for example, it makes it uh, pretty much impossible or difficult to use at least traditional multi-level models um, if you're using like RDS, for example, right? Because then, you know, if you look at someone's ego network, uh, at the person that they recruit, that ego is then gonna be in their network and they're probably gonna have alters in common too, which is just a mess, right? So the, the ideal scenario for MLM is a bunch of um, randomly sampled egos and their alters, right? So ideally we don't want those egos to know each other at all. So something like the GSS is the ideal situation. Um, in, in practice, if the overlap, if we can assume that the overlap is negligible, right? That there's not too much of it, then it's usually okay to proceed. But you definitely don't wanna use this if you're sampling through networks, essentially, right? Or if you're um, looking at ego networks of like a small homogeneous population, like an ethnic enclave or something, right? Like those alters are gonna know each other. Um, another uh, formal requirement is that ego observations are independent of one another. So even though alter observations nested within an ego are not independent, egos still need to be independent, right? So you need independence at level two, okay? So in other words, they're not like members of the same family uh, or they're not like in the same neighborhood, right? Or there aren't things like grouping level variables above ego, or at least if there are, you have to be able to account for them. Okay, does everyone understand these things? At least in some vague way, okay. Um, so why would you use MLM? Um, so your alternative is aggregating to the ego level. So I could do that, right? So I could, um, like I did previously, uh, look at the density of ego's network as an outcome. Um, oh, sorry, that's a bad example because it has to be at the ego level. I could look at percent female in the network, right, as an outcome and a characteristic of ego but I'm losing lots of information. I'm losing lots of information about the gender of the specific ties and also what are the other characteristics of the ties of particular genders, right? So when I'm aggregating up to percent gender, is whatever happening really a function of their gender or a function of other alter level characteristics like how much support they provide that are correlated with gender, right? So I just have way more information and way more sort of precise information uh, if I use all the information that's available to me, if I use all the variation on alters that are available. Um, another thing you can do that sort of technically deals with the problem of dependency at level one is I could just adjust my standard errors with something like cluster robust standard errors, which is super easy to do. Um, but MLM is better because I can then explicitly model the effects of characteristics at these different levels and their interactions with each other, right? Um, so sometimes I really wanna know about, uh, about how much alters vary within egos, for example. That can be a really interesting empirical question, right? So, um, for example, some people, their networks may provide 
uh, sort of the same level of support no matter what. And for somebody else, there might be a ton of variation where they're relying on one person for lots of stuff and then nobody else is doing anything for them. Right? And so those are the kind of things that I can explicitly model with a, a multi-level model. So here are just some of the kinds of questions that you can answer. Um, so I might want to know what affects the formation of ties to alters with particular attributes. Right? So for example, what kinds of egos tend to form cross-racial ties, for example? Um, I might want to know uh, what affects alter behavior or contributions. So uh, what characteristics of egos or alters predict how much support alters provide? Um, I might want to know what affects characteristics of dyads uh, or ties between egos and alters. So uh, I might want to predict um, how much conflict there is in relationship between egos and alters, for example. Um, and then the coolest of all uh, is cross-level interactions. Um, so for example, does the network context moderate the effect of some ego or, or ultra-level uh, characteristic, right? Which is the most awesomest. So this is the general structure of these data. So this says families and children, but you could also pretend that these are egos and alters, right? So this is level one, um, and we usually call this the I, we usually use an I subscript, and then egos, uh, we use a J subscript. Um, so why do we have to account for this dependency? Basically, you get it all wrong. Um, so it depresses your standard errors, and so it makes it a lot easier to find significance when there isn't really any significance. And so while that might be like a really exciting thing for your shitty dissertation data, um, when you like are producing real science, then you usually care uh, about your standard errors. Um, okay, that's the main reason. Okay, so the random intercept model. So this is kind of the most basic uh, variance components model, the most basic multi-level model. Um, and so I'm here to tell you that this is super not complicated at all. Literally, all, we'll do, all we're doing is splitting up a pile of variance. So with OLS regression, we have this pile of variance, right? which is our, our error term essentially, right? Or how much the points on the scatter plot differ from our predicted line. And I'm just gonna split that up into two separate uh, random terms, right? So now each ego is gonna get a random intercept zeta, and then there, we're gonna measure error as how much each alter differs from that random intercept. And I'm gonna show you a picture which is gonna make it really clear. But first I'm gonna show you some confusing uh, Greek letters. Um, so here, before in OLS regression, we had one error term, one random term. I'm just splitting this exact same amount of variation or variance into two separate terms here. Um, so I have my ego-specific random intercept and my dyad-specific error term. Just a minute, I'll show you what it looks like. Um, something we really care about with multi-level modeling is intra-class correlation, uh, or rho. And this is just a measure of between cluster heterogeneity or within cluster homogeneity. It's basically the exact same thing. It's just the different sides of the same coin. So we can also call it um, sort of correlation of observations or alters within an ego network. So the higher row is or the higher the interclass correlation, the more alike my alters are to each other, right? So that actually ends up being a pretty cool measure, right? So here, if you're more of a visual person, which I definitely am, uh, each of these is a cluster, or in our case, an ego. And then these are the alter observations around ego. So over here, we have a situation where we have a low row, right? Or a fair amount of variation. So you can see that the observations differ quite a bit around the ego's average. And then over here, they're really tightly clustered. So we would have a higher interclass correlation or a higher row over here. OK? Does that make sense? That's really what we care about in multi-level modeling is how kind of tightly clustered things are. So the more tightly clustered they are, the more we have to worry about how messed up our standard errors are, basically. Um, that's what I just said. Look at that. So this is the random intercept model. If you're a formula person, again, instead of the one E with one subscript, I now add a zeta, but it's still the exact same pile of variance. And this, to me, is like sort of the most helpful thing in terms of understanding what a multi-level model is doing. 
Um, so for example, I might be interested in what relationship factors affect a person's libido or how much sex two, um, diet or two people in a dyad are having with one another. Uh, I used to use this, <laughs> this example of the number of instruments that uh, alters played predicting how much sex they were having because I think that people that play instruments are su super hot. Um, but then Bernice was like, that's the most ridiculous trite example I've ever heard. So I was like, oh, fine, I can change it. <laughs> so anyway, so now it's m much more boring, but I guess more palatable. Um, and so uh, I might just want to know what's the sort of baseline level of how much sex people are having with their sexual partners, right? So here's my y-intercept. Um, so in this case, we'll say it's six sexual contacts per month, which seems really high. Um, but anyway, um, so this is Jane, right? Jane's an ego, and this is her zeta, right? So this is essentially how different her average is, her network average is, from the, um, from the y-intercept, right? Or the sort of average of the population. And so her intercept is positive. So what does that mean? She's having more sex on average than regular people, I guess. So then within Jane, right, there's also variation. So Jane has three sex partners, Don Juan, so cheesy, um, <laughs> Bob and Anne, right? And so the error term then becomes variation between Jane's uh, random intercept and each of her alter observations. So again, this is the exact same variance, right? Before, the variance would have been here to here, and here to here, and here to here. So all I'm doing now is just explicitly modeling that dependency, or the fact that all these alters, Jane's alters, are more similar than they are to any other random person's alters in terms of how much sex they're having. That's it. That is the entire multi-level model. So I'll add another ego observation here. This is Joe. Uh, his... Um, Zeta is below the y-intercept. What does that mean? Sad. Sad. <laughs> yeah, so Joe is getting less sex, OK? So we can think about this as variation within, variation within, and then the difference between the zetas is variation between, right? So what can I say here about variation within versus between? There is an answer. OK, I'll tell you. Um, there's more variation between than within, right? So egos differ more with regard to how much sex they have with their alters than we see differences between alters nested within a given ego, right? Which totally makes sense, right? Like you have your sex drive and children, whatever else. Um, OK, so if we were to map this out, uh, both Jane and Joe get their own random intercept. So if we were to actually plot their regression line, Jane's would be above the overall regression line and Joe's would be below, but the slopes are the same, right? So we're literally only talking about intercept variation here. And if we were to plot them all, they would look like this. The intercept is random, it varies. And so we're gonna get this overall intercept outputted by Stata or R, and it's a weighted average of each ego's intercept rather than uh, rather than just um, the average of all the level one observations, if I were to pretend that there was no clustering. So it's just gonna be slightly different. In practice, it's often not that different, right? Um, but so it's just calculated in a slightly different way, but it's still interpreted the same way, right? So again, there's nothing sort of like scary or super different here. So let's run one of these in R. Back to the part I am less able to control. I love that. I love not being in control. Um, OK, so I can load. Uh, here I'm going to load a different data set. Um, and so this is Fisher's Northern California data, right? So you all familiar with this? No? Oh my god. Claude Fisher's the bomb. Um, so he collected all these data. Uh, he was interested in the community question, right? Like. Oh, or, you know, is community declining, blah, 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 society is so chaotic and horrible, you know. So he collected all these data and, you know, lo and behold, like, people are still connected to people and uh, he has all these great data. Um, it is an awesome data It's really cool. You want to have a, like, testament to um, in-depth ego network design. Yeah. I mean, they ask people hundreds of 
question. Yep. Yeah. No, it's it's pretty badass. No, they did it all on paper, like to start with, in like the seventies or something, right? Like yeah. late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and it's also there's a third level, which is so fucking cool, because you have neighborhoods, right? So then you can look at. A Sorry. Some people have a hard time loading this data. If you're having a hard time loading um, the data that Reed's about to talk about, type in at the top in your packages um, library. So if you're not getting this in right now, do library haven. If you don't have it, so they may not have haven. have haven. Yeah. So in the brief, you can get the packages. Can do a little demonstration. Why don't you just come to it? Okay. That'll just that'll just be faster. <laughs> just take control. <laughs> okay. So. Haven, we talked about this yesterday very briefly. Oh, that would be nice if I used the mouse at work. Um, it allows you to read in SAS, SPSS, and DTA or SATA file, right? The first thing we're going to do is check that we actually have it. We don't want to install something we already have. And on this machine, we don't have it, so we need to install it. So I'm just going to do this here because I don't feel like typing. All I do is I don't. So this is. Another way to do this. So I'm installing. As the red things just say like it's good. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. I don't I don't I don't know why I, I can read the data without it. Because you're awesome. <laughs> Clearly. Alright. So now that I've got it, I need to read it, right? So I can do it. I'm really lazy today, so I'm doing that. Okay. Now I'm going to try to read this in. Now this is assuming that I got my um, set directory okay, but I think we're all right on that. I hit run. So did were people able to follow along? Did people get the data in? Okay. If there's still people that have problems, raise your hand. I'll come mm -hmm. around. But okay. If if also you tried this and it's like ah, uh, I actually was working with someone earlier. This is one of those moments where R probably is having a conniption. Just save your script so there's no red top. What I'm talking about is in here. There's no red. Save. Sign out of R. Be nice to R. Don't just quit. Quit session. Please don't sign out. I'm not. <laughs> bring it down. Bring it back up. And then we can try to do this again really quick. And it probably will resolve it. We'll have to load Haven again, but it'll probably resolve the error. All right. Sorry about that. That's OK. Thank you. Oh, I love that Like the person who knows R's response to R is like, bah. <laughs> like, yeah, that pretty much is so my sentiment. Point, I think with Haven, you'll have to use read underscore DTA instead of dot. I think uh, dot yeah. is dependent on the foreign package. So there needs to be an underscore here yeah. instead of a dot. Oh, so if you loaded the forum package, which you should have, you should already be able to read it. Okay, that, so that's another way to check. So if you, um, check if you have forum loaded, and if not, do the lazy hit the GUI way. That's very helpful. Pull down menus. Yay. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. Okay, so hopefully everybody's data are in there. Uh, if we had more time, we would describe the data. You could look at it at the different levels. Well, fuck it. Let's do it. Um, Oh, Christ almighty. I, I give up on you. Oh, never mind. Okay, so we're going to just run the model. That's what we're going to do. 
So this is what's called an empty or a null model. So there are no independent variables. I'm just running an empty multi-level model or an empty random intercept model, uh, which gives me a good baseline ICC, right? So I can see just sort of at baseline um, how much clustering is there in my data, um, which might give me an idea of whether I even really need a multi-level model. Um, so uh, I could go through and explain this. Basically, this is your dependent variable. You're going to do tilde 1 if it's an empty model, um, and then random tilde 1, which basically says there's going to be a random intercept, but there are not going to be any random coefficients. We could put variables in there, but that comes later. We may or may not get to that. Um, the rest of these options, uh, like this is the REML is the, um, oh my god, what's the word I'm looking for? It's the, yeah, it's a, it's a restricted mod. Basically, it allows you to relax like this shitty assumption of MLM that everyone violates all the time. And if you don't violate it, then it gives you the same answer anyway. So always use REML for our net forever and ever, amen. Um, yeah. OK, so let's just go ahead and run it, because what we really care about is the output. So I'm going to run the model. I'm going to output the results from the model. And then Vericore just gives me the variance instead of the, um, the standard deviations of the residuals. OK, so what I'm going to do really quickly is um, move from R back to my slides because what I did is I have the same R, R, R output and I annotated it all with like labels for what everything is so that you all can see that as I'm talking and running through the results, um, which I think will be helpful. Let's see. Okay, so this analysis, okay, so this analysis that I'm running uh, is basically asking um, what are the effects of ego and alter gender on the number of support functions provided by an alter to an ego. So the dependent variable is at the alter level, right? It's how much support is that alter providing. So it varies across alters. Some alters provide more support, some provide less. Um, and so I could see a world where uh, women potentially give and get more support, right? Which is what I would hypothesize. Um, so here's the output. This is, uh, this is the null model. So this is the empty model. So we always start by running the null model. Um, and so I'm going to point to things. So let me carry these. OK. So in your output, this is the standard deviation of the random intercepts. So these are the random effects or the random part of your model. And then the fixed effects are going to be below. Um, and this is the standard deviation of your residuals. So in the formula that I showed you before, this is the standard deviation of the zetas, and this is the standard deviation of the e's, right? Um, and so this is your y-intercept, which is a fixed parameter in your model. And you interpret this just as you would a regular y-intercept. So on average, alters provide not quite one support function. I think the range is like 0 to 5 or something, OK? Um, and then this is your standardized distribution of residuals. So if you're interested in knowing kind of how those residuals are, di are distributed around the random intercept, uh, you can look at that here. Uh, other bits of useful information tells you how many observations and how many groups you have. So we know that we have um, 1,050 egos and 19,000 alters. So that's why I get so excited when I see this number. I just want to pet it a little bit and love on it, right? Because that, um, that gives me some power. Um, so then uh, we typically want to report the variance. I don't know why. People just don't generally report the standard deviation of the random effects. So you can use this Vericore command uh, that calls the Model 6 uh, estimates. And then it will output the, the variation. So this is, is your theta and your, I don't remember what the devil's fork is called, um, but these are the two things that you need to uh, calculate rho, right, or the interclass correlation. Because R sucks, you have to calculate it yourself. Theta just outputs it automatically. Um, but again, um, it's uh, devil's fork over devil's fork plus theta. 
and so you get an inter-class correlation of about 0.06. So you can interpret this pretty much exactly as you would a uh, correlation coefficient. So there's a low level of correlation um, of alters within an ego. So there's actually quite, quite um, a lot of variation, right, in terms of how much alters, how much support alters provide to egos, right, even to the same ego, right? So that's kind of cool, right? Like, that's interesting to know. Okay, so now I'm going to run, run the very next model, which should be model seven on your script. Um, and this is a not empty model, and this has uh, ego gender and alter gender. So here, instead of the one, I'm going to add my two independent variables. Um, and that's the only thing about the, the um, R script that's going to be different. So when I output here, right, um, I, can, I now have some fixed effects, like some meat here, something interesting that I could interpret. Um, I could look back at the standard deviations of my residuals. When I start putting uh, variables in, those can change, right? Because I'm explaining some of the variation within and between, right? So if I add ego level variables, then that's going to explain some of the between person variation. If I add alter level vari variables, then my variance for the alter level or the errors, the E's should get smaller, right? Because Theoretically, I'm explaining some of that variation, and so it's not error anymore. Um, so anyway, these are my fixed effects, and I interpret those exactly as I would a regular regression coefficient. Um, so it looks like ego gender here, this is a linear model. Um, it looks like ego gender here doesn't matter, right? So there's no effect of ego's gender on how much support alters provide, but women provide um, a little bit more support on average than men do. Right? Okay. Is that relatively clear? Okay. Everybody was able to run the model? Okay, good. Okay, so something we have to talk about. This is like a dirty, ugly secret. It's not really a secret, but it's something you have to do that, um, that people don't always do. Okay, so I don't have a lot of time to explain this, but basically the random effects model assumes that your level one alter covariates are not correlated with your random intercept. Um, and so this is a problem because every single characteristic of an alter varies both within and between clusters, right? So in other words, alter gender contributes information both to the alter, right? Tells us what the alter's gender is, but it also contributes information about the gender composition of the network. Right, so they can't ever really be totally independent. So this is a problem because in only, include, only including the level one variable, we're assuming that those two effects are equal, right? And when, when in reality, those effects could be in opposite directions in theory, right? Or they could just be different in magnitude. Um, okay, so we can fix this really easily by adding what's called a contextual effect. Um, and then at the same time, these contextual effects are also super, super interesting. Um, all it is, it's really easy, it's just the aggregated version of your alter level variable. So for gender, for example, I would want to include proportion female. So I include alter gender and then also the gender composition of the network, right? Um, or I might want to do the closeness of the alter and then the mean closeness of the network. Right, so whatever your aggregated version of that alter level variable is, you include that in the model. Um, and then it essentially tests whether the network level uh, has an effect above and beyond the individual level. So in other words, for this, um, for this particular uh, model that we're running right now, maybe being in a network full of women affects how much support alter provides to ego above and beyond alter's own gender, right? which is super cool. Right? We want to know that. So there might be some sort of like feminization of the network. So like if I'm a dude in a network of like a bunch of women, maybe I start acting more like women and providing like lots more support to that to to my um, to my friends or whatever. So the first step in R is to just create the aggregated variable using the AV command or the AVE command. Um, so again, this is the command. It should be already in your R script, um, but I'm going to create a new variable called netfem. So usually when I create an aggregated variable, I want to name it the same way, right? So all those are going to start with net or with n, for example, just so that I can keep things consistent in my mind. Um, 
and I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to tell it I'm going to use a function, and the function I'm going to use is the mean, ah, which is the same as the proportion, right, for a binary variable, which is what I'm dealing with here. Um, okay, I'm then going to take that times 10, and this is just for interpretation purposes, because otherwise I have the proportion. So I'm moving from 0 to 1, which is no women, to all women, which is like a pretty big space, right, in terms of, or jump in terms of interpretation. So if I take it times 10, I'm looking then at 10% increases in uh, the percent women in the network. Um, so I can run my model with my new contextual effect. So this is the, the same model as model seven. I've just added my new variable here. Um, and I can look down and I see that my contextual effect is significant and that it's in the opposite direction as, as uh, alter gender, right? So if, if I'm a woman, then I tend to provide more support uh, to, to my ego uh, than men in that network. But um, by the same token, if you're in a network that contains lots of women, every individual alter provides less support, right? Um, I don't know, I could think of some reasons why that might be. So, you know, it could be that um, there's like a, a wh oh, what's that effect called when like you think somebody else is just gonna do it? Bystander, yeah. What did free rider? Same thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so here's a case where I added the contextual variable. It's super fucking interesting, and it's in the opposite direction, right? So we would not have known that if we had just included the one alter level variable that assumed that the effects of gender at the alter and the network level were the same, right? So it's problematic in terms of interpretation, and it's also just a really bad assumption most of the time, right? Okay. So we can look in, let's see. So what? Hi. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question actually about interpreting um, the ego effects versus the alter effects. OK. So the alter effects, if it's higher, then the alters are providing more support to the ego. Yes. So for the ego, if it's higher, are they receiving more support? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the dependent variable is always how much support the alter is providing to ego. Okay. Right? So does that make sense? So yes. yeah. yeah, so so if, if I'm a woman, how much support are my alters providing to me? Yeah. Not how much am I providing to them. Okay. It's always what alter is doing for me. Right? That's gonna remain consistent no matter what level you're looking at. Yeah. Can I just ask about the ten? Is that a rule of thumb or yeah, it's just a, a rule of thumb. You know, it's kind of like, you know, with age, you usually look in tens of years, or income, you look in tens of thousands of dollars, because otherwise you get some, like, wonky, tiny coefficient, or, or some gigantic coefficient that makes it look like it's a huge effect, when really you're just moving from one absolute end of the distribution to the other, right? So yeah, it's just a rule of thumb, but it makes sense. That's a good question. Other questions? Yeah. Why did you use 10 and not 100? Because that, like, if it was a proportion, now it goes from 0 to 10. Yes. Done. Yeah. So, so I would have the opposite problem if I used 100, because then each one unit increase would be a 1% increase. So it would range from 0 to 100. So I would have a teeny tiny coefficient. <laughs> so it's kind of like finding the right balance between, like, giant coefficient and teeny tiny coefficient. Tens usually work pretty well. Okay, other questions? Oh my God, we have 15 minutes, people. <laughs> All right, random coefficient model. So um, I don't really need to spend that much time on this because it's just a really simple extension of the random intercept model. Um, and so before we said that each ego needs its own random intercept to account for intercept differences between egos, right? Uh, all the random coefficient model does is add a slope. Right, to that, right? So it's the idea that the effect of some alter level variable may not be the same across all egos, which seems like kind of a ridiculous assumption to make in the first place, right? So, you know, whether the, the, gender, comp or the, the gender in my network may not have the same effect as gender in Jim's network, right? And that seems like a really crazy thing to assume to begin with, right? So, but we always run the random intercept model first because sometimes, um, the random coefficient doesn't, doesn't matter, but that's something that we can explicitly test. 
Um, so for the, this communication and libido example, um, here, if we were to give Jane and Joe, remember we're going back to Jane and Joe, um, and how much sex they're having, these are our old friends. Um, remember that Jane was having more sex on average than, uh, than like the average person, but also definitely more than Joe, sad Joe. Um, so we could give each of them their own sort of regression line based on their own alter observ observations, and that's all a, a random coefficient or random slope is doing. So here I could look at something like quality of communication, and I might think that as communication in a dyad improves, that uh, people would be having more sex. I read this in Cosmopolitan, so I think it's true. Um, I don't know. Um, so this is the, uh, the regression equation. So all I'm doing literally is I have that same pile of variance and I'm splitting it up again. So now I have my random intercept, but I'm also going to have a, a random coefficient, right? So we're going to have a zeta sub 1 for each ego that also varies. And it just looks like this, right? So um, this is our regular regression line, our overall regression line. And Jane is going to get both an intercept bump and a slope bump because her slope is steeper uh, than the average slope, right? So again, same variance, just splitting it up. Poor Joe, he's also going to get uh, a, an intercept and a slope sort of deficit. Because apparently communication doesn't matter to Joe. <laughs> so if we were to plot all of the egos in our data set, uh, instead of all these lines being parallel like they were with the random intercept model, now they're like, you know, a haystack. It never looks this pretty. P.S. I, I made this up. Um, it usually looks like a hot disaster. Um, but here's Jane and here's Joe, and there's some overall intercept line, uh, beta sub 1, that's reported in Stata or R. Um, and it's just the weighted average of each ego's intercept and slope, not the same intercept and slope you would get if you just used the observations and didn't account for clustering. Make sense? That's the only way that an MLM differs. Super simple. It's just voodoo. OK. Again, we're just splitting up piles of variance. Same amount of variance. We're not reducing any variance. We're just splitting it up into different random terms. Okay? Now three instead of two. So suppose I want to know if the effect of alter gender on support provision varies across egos, right? Which is the example that I just gave. Yeah, it probably does, right? Because like I interact differently with women than men than probably some any other random person does, right? So this just seems obvious. So I can run my random coefficient model. Um, the thing that you'll really want to know if you're going to actually run this in R is that now instead of a 1 over here, I'm going to put the variable name for the independent variable that I want to get its own slope. Right? So here, this is alter gender. So this is not going to be a level 2 variable. This is not going to be a characteristic of ego. Why? Huh? Yeah, it's not going to vary, right? So you're not going to put any ego level variables in there. That doesn't make any sense. It's the same across all the egos. My God, I love you. You're like, you're, like you're listening. You're with me. You're there. Um, okay, so I'm going to run the model and store, it, uh, store the estimates in model 9. And then I'm going to run an LR test, which basically just compares my random intercept to the exact same random slope model. And this is going to tell me whether I need random coefficients or not. Right, so um, I don't have time to explain all the details, but essentially it's like, well, are these random slopes equal to zero? Um, that's the null hypothesis. If I reject the null, then I need the random coefficients. Right, so in this case, uh, I need them just barely, but still I'm going to put them in there. Right, okay. Um, so now the really cool thing about a random coefficient model is that I get a extra, couple extra little random parameters that are super interesting to interpret that are totally underused, I think. Um, so we have the, the standard deviation of the random intercepts. Now you're running model 9, um, which we had before. And then the standard deviation of the residuals, which we had before. And then we now have the standard deviation of the random slopes, okay, which is new. But now we have this super interesting thing here, which I love. And that's the correlation between your random slopes and random intercepts, right? Which essentially tells you if your line is steeper, right, and your intercept is higher, are those things related to each other, right? 
So a correlation of 0.13 between our random slopes and intercepts tells us that in ego networks that provide more support on average, the effect of alter gender is larger on average. So that's kind of cool. I don't know what I would really do with that, but like surely you can think of like all sorts of interesting questions that you could um, ask and answer, right? Um, okay, so uh, then now we have intercept variation between egos uh, and then slope variation between egos. And so now this is part of our total variance. So it changes the way we calculate our ICC slightly, um, but our ICC is still about the same at about 0.05. So we can calculate that. What time is it? OK, I think we can finish this, because everyone knows that I love interactions. So let's, let's finish this out. OK, so cross-level interactions are like the best thing ever, ever, ever. Um, and so it's this idea that you have these level one variables, so characteristics of alters or ties, um, that uh, their effect can vary as a function of what's happening at the network level, right? So it's usually, yeah, how does some alter level variable change in its influence depending on what the network looks like? So it's not that different from regular interactions. You do it exactly the same way that you normally would, so that's cool, um, except that you want to make sure you're using a random coefficient model. Can anybody guess why? I'm coming to you in like two seconds if people don't answer it. Why would I not want why would I not want to constrain those slopes to be equal <laughs> across people? Because so so in running an interaction model, I'm literally saying that those slopes are not equal across people. <laughs> right? Like that's the whole point of an interaction model. Yeah, so it doesn't really make any sense, right? So that's literally the only thing you have to remember is to include that variable as a, as a, random, um, as a random slope, okay? Um, so let's say that I wanna know, this is where it gets so cool, um, say I wanted to know whether the effective alter gender differs for male and female egos, right? So why might this be true? Yeah, yeah, women interact differently with women than they do with men. Men interact differently with, yeah, blah, 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 right? So there are these effects of gender in social interactions. Soch 100, um, yeah, exactly. So I can run this interaction model. Um, and so in R, the way that I'm gonna do it is um, I'm just gonna put the asterisk here. Uh, I also want to interact the level two version or the contextual version. Right, because it doesn't make sense to make the, the variable at level one allow that to vary as a function of ego gender, but then to constrain the effect of um, the percent female in the network to be the same for egos, right? That just doesn't really make sense. I can take it out later if it's not significant, but you start with it in there. Um, and then over here you can see that it's cut off, but I'm of course including that random coefficient um, over here for alter gender. So interaction terms, which I love. Um, so, okay, so let's look at the effect of alter gender when ego is a woman. So that's this coefficient right here. So it is not significant. Oh no, sorry, that's when ego is a man. So alter gender has no effect when the ego is a man. Um, but then if I take that and add it to my interaction term here, which is 0.19, I end up with a really positive coefficient. And so adding these together gives me about 0.17, and that's the effect of alter being a woman when ego is also a woman, right? So that's a pretty big uh, gender difference. This is a, a linear model, yay, so we can take this as proof positive that the interaction is significant. Um, however, the interaction of the contextual variable is not significant. So we could drop that interaction term out of the model if we wanted to, right? So I can plot it and that makes it even more clear. Essentially, when ego is a man, that's here, there's no significant effect of alter gender, 
um, on number of support functions, but when ego is a woman, there's a pretty big positive effect of um, the alter being a woman, right? So that's pretty awesome if you care about gender and support and health, right? <laughs> you seem unconvinced. Uh, anyway, maybe it's just me. Um, okay, so that's how you do a cross-level interaction. Um, it is now almost five o'clock. I was gonna teach you about ego network dynam dynamics, which I literally love even more than interaction terms. Um, I don't have time to do that, but you can read through the slides. There's also a really big, long, detailed chapter in our book about this. And since I cheated you out of this lecture, if you're interested in it, I can just send you a copy, PDF copy of that chapter, okay? And it's gonna give you way more information than I was going to here. Um, so I guess other than that, I'm finished. And you all can go home. <laughs> so, thank you.